On September 13, 1963, the last of more than 400,000 buckets of concrete was poured into the Glen Canyon Dam. Behind it would sit Lake Powell, America's second largest reservoir. After taking 17 years to fill, Lake Powell would hold more than 8 trillion gallons of water, enough to cover the entire state of Kentucky in a foot of water. That water would be used for drinking, irrigation, recreation, hydropower, and flood control. That water has been one of the most important development tools in the history of the southwestern United States. But Glen Canyon Dam has a dark side. The benefits it provides are not without their costs. The Glen Canyon Dam has altered the flow of the Colorado River in such a way that it has changed the very geology and ecology of the Grand Canyon. Countless plants and animals, along with their habitats, have been drowned under Lake Powell's cerulean waters, along with innumerable Anasazi ruins and artifacts. So, do the costs outweigh the benefits? Or do the benefits justify the costs? Where you fall in that debate probably has a lot to do with how you think about the natural world and our place within it. Is it something to be subjugated and bent to our will? Or something to be respected and left alone? These are age-old questions, and really, they get at the heart of the Glen Canyon controversy. But if you want to understand that controversy, the Glen Canyon Dam, the reasons it was built, the arguments both for and against it, you have to go back. Not just to when the dam was built, but before that even. You have to go back to Hetch Hetchy. Now, I'm not going to rehash the entire story of Hetch Hetchy here. I made an entire video on it that goes into way more detail, which I'll link in the description below. But there's a through line between Hetch Hetchy and Glen Canyon. Hetch Hetchy was a battle between preservation and conservation. Those who wanted the valley to remain as it was, and those who wanted to utilize it for human benefit. By the time the Glen Canyon Dam comes around, this battle is in full swing. Americans were being forced to choose between the idea of wealth and prosperity or the idea of leisure and preservation. These ideas are not mutually exclusive, but the issue was framed that way. If you weren't in favor of growth and development, you were seen as impeding progress, and if you weren't in favor of preservation, you were seen as greedy and destructive. Of course, in the West, nothing brought these issues to the fore more than water. Water was a universal requirement for cities to grow. In many ways, water is more valuable in the West than land. There's just not a lot of it to go around. If the West was to grow and develop as the East had, it would need a steady and reliable source of water. And no other source of water was as crucial to Western development as the Colorado River. Winding and carving its way from its headwaters in the Rockies, the Colorado River is the lifeblood of the hot, dry, southwestern United States. It's for that very reason that the Colorado was chosen as the backbone of a landmark water agreement one which still governs water rights in the West today. That agreement was signed in 1922 and is known as the Colorado River Compact. The compact essentially divided up Colorado River water among seven states split between an upper and lower basin. Upper basin states, including Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, and New Mexico received 7.5 million acre feet of water, while the lower basin states of Arizona, Nevada, and California received the same. Each basin would split its allocated share among participating states, ensuring the Colorado's nourishment could encourage growth and development across the region. We now know that this agreement was built on flawed foundations. In the decades since, it's been determined that Colorado River flows were abnormally high at that time. In other words, they overallocated the water. They also underallocated how much development they anticipated. The West has grown faster and more expansively than anyone could have imagined. We're still dealing with the consequences of these decisions, but I'll come back to that in a bit. Because, in order to actually implement this compact, there had to be some sort of mechanism, some way to actually store the water so the states could use it. They needed a way to store it and dish it out when needed. And this is where our friends at the Bureau of Reclamation come in. Storing and dishing water is kind of their thing. Now, 
I want to take a quick detour here and talk about our friends at the Bureau. They're key players in this entire story. Their philosophy as an agency can really help us contextualize this idea of conservation versus preservation. Here's a quote from a Bureau publication back in the 80s. Quote, The arid west essentially has been reclaimed. The major rivers have been harnessed and facilities are in place or are being completed to meet the most pressing current water demands and those of the immediate future. Look at that language. Reclaimed. Harnessed. This quote represents a mindset. A way of viewing the natural world. Something to be brought into line and used to benefit us. Now, even though they were created in 1902, the Bureau of Reclamation didn't become a big player in the federal government until 1928, with the construction of the Hoover Dam. This is where they learned the playbook. See, the Hoover Dam was never intended to be a tourist destination. It was purely a water and power project. But the Bureau of Reclamation knew with that big reservoir just sitting there, that people would want to swim and boat and recreate on it. Only the Bureau of Reclamation wasn't a conservation agency, or a tourism agency, or a recreation agency. See earlier quote, they didn't know the first thing about managing a reservoir for recreation. They built dams. But you know who did know a thing about recreation? The National Park Service. And so Reclamation pitches this idea to the Park Service that they can jointly manage the Hoover Dam. Reclamation takes care of the water and power, and the Park Service takes care of the recreation. That way, the whole project can be pitched as a conservation victory. Water and power development can go ahead, and people can get a place to enjoy nature and recreate responsibly. Sound familiar? Yeah, this is the Hetch Hetchy argument. The playbook. And the Park Service knew that, so they were wary. They didn't go for this proposal initially. They just didn't see a man-made structure like the Hoover Dam as worthy of inclusion in the national park system. NPS Associate Director Conrad Worth said that he did not, quote, see how this area could be considered for a national park on account of its artificial makeup, end quote. After Hetch Hetchy, they didn't want to be seen as promoting dams in national parks. They actually fought construction of dams in Glacier and Yellowstone after Hetch Hetchy. They preferred a strong preservation mandate. But Reclamation basically said, look, this dam is getting built and people are going to want to use the reservoir. Can't you just help us out a bit? And after much political wrangling, the Park Service reluctantly came up with this idea of the National Recreation Area, a designation it pretty much uses only for reclaimed reservoirs. Of the 18 National Recreation Areas in the park system, 12 are developed around reservoirs. This was the playbook using conservation and recreation as a smokescreen for the development of water and power projects. And the Bureau of Reclamation used it over and over and over again. This was the backdrop to the construction of the Glen Canyon Dam. The Bureau of Reclamation devised this plan called the Colorado River Storage Project, or CRSP for short. The CRSP was a plan to build a series of dams in several key locations within the Colorado River Basin. That way, water could be impounded behind them and allocated to basin states as needed. National recreation areas were planned for many of these reservoirs. The playbook. Only preservationists were about to call an audible. As it was proposed in 1950, the project was to include four main dams plus several other associated projects. One at Flaming Gorge in Wyoming, one on the Gunnison River in Colorado, one on the San Juan River in New Mexico, and one in Dinosaur National Monument. John Muir must have been rolling in his grave. Surely not again. Here was an existing unit of the National Park Service again being proposed as the location for a dam. And once again, it was being spun as a victory for conservation and recreation, all at the expense of a scenic and altogether breathtaking landscape in Western Colorado's high country. The thing was, like Hetch Hetchy, Dinosaur was remote and visitation was low. Nobody really knew about it at the time, so they saw no harm in trying to submerge it underwater. For what it's worth, the Park Service wasn't a big fan of this scheme either. NPS Superintendent Newton Jury had this to say of the Bureau of Reclamation's plan. Quote, The Great Bureau of Reclamation was like the state of Prussia in the German Empire, where everything was weighted in its favor. 
I think it's safe to say he didn't like them very much. But Drury wasn't the only one opposed to the Echo Park Dam. Led by the fiery David Brower, the Sierra Club, still reeling from the destruction of Hetch Hetchy, charged ahead with a full-blown preservation campaign as well. They wrote articles, they wrote books, they wrote pamphlets, they published pictures, they went on expeditions, all in an attempt to get people on board with the preserving of this place. One advocate, Harold Bradley, after floating the rivers, said, quote, The experience of threading our way through this superb gallery of matchless pictures displayed in ever-changing vistas left us aghast at the thought that the Bureau of Reclamation Engineers are calmly planning the destruction of this monument. It was a hard-fought battle, and their fight actually paid off. When legislation for the Colorado River Storage Project was passed, it did not include the Echo Park Dam in Dinosaur National Monument. In fact, it included a provision that no dam be constructed in any national park within the project's area. This was an important precedent. A line had been drawn between national parks and other protected lands. They were finally seen as having value for their own sake, not just as another piece in the utilitarian conservation puzzle. The New York Times columnist John Oak said at the time that the victory was, quote, of vital importance in demonstrating for the future that these types of battles could be won, end quote. But this victory would also come at a cost. The cost of Glen Canyon. See, while everyone was focused on dinosaur, the stunning beauty of Glen Canyon had flown under the radar. The Park Service didn't have their eye on it, and the major environmental groups really were focused on keeping dams out of existing parks, of which Glen Canyon was not one of. So when it was included in the CRSP legislation, the environmental groups decided to drop their opposition. The Bureau of Reclamation now had free reign to dam Glen Canyon. It was only after it was too late that the beauty and wonder of that sandstone cathedral became known. In the decades since, serious questions have arisen about Glen Canyon Dam's necessity and viability. In terms of ecology, the dam acts as a massive barrier to sediment deposition. Before the dam was built, sediment carried by warm water flowed down the Colorado and deposited itself in the Grand Canyon, creating sandbars and habitat for countless native species. With the dam now in place, cool water is released without sediment, eroding the sandbars and destroying Grand Canyon riparian habitat. Behind the dam, side canyons filled with plants, animals, and historic Anasazi ruins have been drowned. Downstream, so much water has been diverted from the Colorado River that its delta on the Gulf of California is drying up, again destroying wetland and riparian habitat for countless plants and animals. These are ecosystem-wide impacts taking place along the length of the Colorado River and throughout the Southwest as a whole. And while the fight for Dinosaur National Monument solidified the position of park preservation, they themselves are not immune to these impacts. Just because dams are not built in them doesn't mean those impacts don't flow through them. Each of these impacts was tolerated in the name of water and power development. But if the dam can no longer perform these functions, can its existence be justified? We might have to answer those questions sooner rather than later. Like I mentioned before, the Colorado River Compact was signed at a time when river flows were historically high. That agreement overestimated the amount of water available and underestimated the amount of development. As a result, there simply isn't enough Colorado River water to sustain current development patterns. And climate change has thrown this all out of whack. With the west and mega drought conditions, water levels in Lake Powell have dropped to their lowest ever. The reservoir sits more than 170 feet below full pool, nearly 50 feet lower than last year. At this rate, Lake Powell could stop generating hydropower as soon as 2023. The reality Western water managers never hoped would come is here. It's forcing tough decisions to be made. And once again, we are reckoning with those age old questions. Do the costs outweigh the benefits? Or do the benefits justify the costs? Is nature something to be subjugated to our will? Or, in this case, returned to its natural state? It might be time we find answers to those questions. If you like learning about parks and protected areas, consider giving this video a like and subscribing to the channel. I tell park stories like this one, and you can help me bring them to a bigger audience. 
Thanks for watching. Goodbye.